Welcome to the Best of Bumper to Bumper podcast for Tuesday, May 12th. It is a Tandem Tuesday. We're going to hear from longtime friends Lou Nanny and Phil Esposito as we continue our Legends with Louie conversations that we have done each and every Tuesday since we've all been sheltering in place. But we started the Best of Bumper to Bumper podcast today with another tandem, our guy Trent Tucker and his former teammate and friend B.J. Armstrong, former Chicago Bull, former Charlotte Hornet, highly featured in the Jordan documentary, chatted with B.J. and Double T to start the Best of Bumper to Bumper podcast. Double T, welcome back to the uh, to the program, man. How you holding up? I'm holding up pretty good. How about you? Well, we're excited because we're going to get B.J. Uh, Armstrong in about two minutes, your uh, your former teammate. Garzi had reached out to him. And I was I, I was pessimistic because, as you know, everybody wants, wanted to talk to him, especially after the last two episodes of The Last Dance, for all the obvious reasons, because he played such a prominent role in a number of stories and was so quotable. But um, he got the right number. And then the, the way it was told to me by Guardsy, uh, BJ said, hey, how about if we put Double T on, why don't we just do it together? I said, even better. It's always good <laughs> to have teammates yeah. back on uh, together as well, correct? Yeah, you know, BJ has, you know, BJ was, was very instrumental um, in being a part of Michael's George circle for guys who hung out with him, you know, off the court. Mm-hmm. And for, for, for multiple years, you know, many people said that Michael was not really close with his teammates, but and during the time I was there, you know, he and I, along with BJ and another guy named Daryl Walker, we yeah. spent a lot of time together, you know, off the court. And, and by me being, you know, a little bit older and a veteran, yep. you know, we had a lot of things in common, you know, so when the game was over, we could sit down and talk about things other than basketball. And our relationship just kind of grew from there. Yeah, there's no question about that. And, and you know, that's one of the things we're going to talk about once I think Gardzi's uh, setting up B, uh, BJ Armstrong right now to be, uh, part of this discussion as well, because it was um, throughout. You and I have talked about the sort of the 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 Jordan killer instinct deal and how uh, demanding he could be on people before. So I, I'm not, you know, that's not new. I don't think that's a revelation. I guess Double T. In fact, let's uh, let's uh, uh, add B J Armstrong to the conversation as uh, well, of course, uh, former Chicago Bull. And, BJ, as we welcome you to the show, we got your guy, uh, Trent Tucker, on the other uh, other line. Say hi to, uh, to, double, to double T. Trent Tucker, that's Mr. Tucker. It's always a pleasure to be in the, 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 <laughs> the greatness of the great, Trent Tucker, <laughs> uh, BJ. It's what it's, yeah, it's my man right there, BJ Armstrong. You know, uh, you know, BJ was very instrumental. Uh, he, had, you know, he may tell you guys this later on, but he was very instrumental in me becoming the Chicago Bull as well. Oh, t- do tell. Let's hear that story. Well, that's wasn't a good another Baker to... Square breakfast, was it, or, or was that just Jordan? <laughs> or, 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 or was it a dinner on the Magnificent Mile somewhere instead? <laughs> no, you, you know, we, we spent, you know, in, in a strange place, you know, he and I sat down and had a long conversation over a summer basketball game in Little Rock, Arkansas. Little Rock, Arkansas, you see. How did it, how did that end up being the meeting place? <laughs> well, you know, Scotty Pippen was having a, a celebrity all-star game, ah. and I was, I was invited to come down and play, and that's where BJ and I really kind of, hooked up and started to talk about basketball and, and, and different things here and there, and we became uh, pretty close friends from there. And then when he got back to Chicago, you know, my name became, my name began to circle about, you know, one of the few players that might be able to come in and be a piece of the puzzle, and, and B.J. was instrumental in that conversation also. B.J., did you get a cut of the deal when uh, you got one uh, double? Uh, <laughs> uh, well, you know what? <laughs> the, the real deal is just being around Trent. So, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> I, I had I had a whole year to be with Trent. I had a whole year to to smile and laugh, and here we are, some twenty five, thirty years later, still smiling. And uh, he was the best. I mean, Trent came in that year. He was terrific for us. He fit right into our group, and uh, he was very instrumental with uh, with our team and what he brought to you know he brought he was he was a tough defender. He was a pro's pro, and uh, he always made big shots. He had all, he always made timely big shots, so it was great for us. It just seemed like a no-brainer, and uh, he fit in seamlessly, and 
as they say, the rest is history because we know Trent could shoot it with the best of them. No doubt about that. BJ, uh, you're getting a lot of attention after parts seven and eight. I don't have to tell you. That's why we appreciate you giving us the time you did because I know you're under siege and, and, and a lot of people have wanted to talk to you. And, you know, we've all kind of been amused by the, about the Baker Square breakfast. Uh, it, it's just it's too good on so many levels. But is it, is it fair to say, should you have gotten a few extra rings? Because I think everybody's trying to figure out if that breakfast had, was it in your mind inevitable that Michael was going to come back? Or do you think you facilitated, you played a key role in, in Michael, in, in the idea of getting, putting him in, in his head to come back when he did? Well, I, you know, I, w- I would love to take credit <laughs> for something, but the truth of it is it was inevitable that he was going to come back. And, you know, Trent will tell you that's what we did, right? This is pre-cell phone, so we actually talked to each other. Actually, Trent and I, we didn't even have to wait for a menu. If Trent was running late or I was late, we always knew. We were going to get the pancakes. Trent maybe like, his eggs are reason. We, that's what we did back then, right? <laughs> and Trent and I spent many a morning grabbing breakfast. That's where you talk. That's kind of where you, you know, you just kind of started your day. So I think it was inevitable. And, and Trent can share with you as well, like, that's what we did. And we, we, we were, yes, we were competitors and we were teammates, but, you know, we were friends. And you wanted to be a good friend. And uh, Trent is a, an example of it. You know, Trent has a relationship with all of those guys on the team. He talks to everyone like I talk to everyone. He talks to MJ because that's what we do. That's what we did back then. And that's what made those guys and those groups special. And and here I am doing a, a radio interview with my friend, right? Yeah, I know he's the great Trent Tucker, but I know him as my friend. So, uh, you know, it's fun and to hear everyone tell their stories. But it was inevitable that he was going to come back, and and um, I'm just happy that he, that Michael, as Trent can tell you, he he really enjoyed being one of the guys probably more than anything, and that's what we know him as. We just know him as MJ, and you know the Air Jordan guy is is great, but MJ is is our friend. Yeah, I'm glad you bring that up because, as you know, the theme of the last couple episodes, uh, largely at least the way it's been been reviewed since, and people have debated since, is doubling down on how demanding Michael can be and that Michael even admitted sometimes he was capable of of crossing the line. You're also indicating to me, though, I I think an important part of the story, I think we we can end up getting so carried away with that angle that people start thinking of him as some sort of a monster. And I'm, I'm hoping both of you could speak to that particular issue of the dichotomy of, yeah, he could be... Jack Assian, when he went after somebody to demand a lot, but it also sounds as if, obviously, um, it wasn't as if he did not strike up any relationships, lasting relationships, and that you guys then and even now still feel like you have, uh, you know, good relationships with Michael. Explain that contrast so people can understand it. But I can go ahead, Trent. I, uh, you know, the, the beauty of playing with someone like a Michael Jordan, you know the intensity is there. But as much as Michael Jordan challenged us to be better, we challenged him to be better as well because we knew that it was nice that when we were in tough situations that he was going to be the guy you know, that, could, that could bring it home. But also, you know, when you, when you are a competitor and you're lucky enough to play on the championship-type team, you want to live up to those expectations. You want not only prove to yourself, you know, that you can play at that level, but also you want to accept the challenge of, of proving to your teammates also that you can play at that level. You know, so the more intensity, the more intensity that Michael Jordan brought to the table, you know, we brought the same intensity as well because we want not only to prove to ourselves, but like I mentioned, to prove to our teammates that we were able to get the job done also. BJ, let me uh, give you a chance to answer that question, and I'll, I'll phrase the question a little differently. Um, I'm sure you saw the comments from Charles Barkley. I think he was on with Dan Levitard on ESPN Radio. And he, and he said, you know, he has, he being Michael, has selective prosecution over there, right? He knows who to pick on. Michael's awesome, but there's certain guys you can't treat like that. You have to know what guys you can treat badly and they're going to accept it, screaming at guys all the time and punching guys, come on, man. There's certain guys that would whoop the hell out of you if you tried to do that. He has selective prosecution. I mean, Scotty Burrell, Steve Kerr, I mean, come on, man. BJ, do you agree with with Charles or what do you think? 
Well, um, I'll say this, and, and, I, and from the outside looking in, I could see how someone could say that, and, and that, that, that may be the case of what it looks like from that perspective. But being inside and being in those practices and being in that locker room, um, and I think Trent can speak to this as well, when you're playing with someone who has no other agenda other than to win, okay, there was no other agenda. This wasn't I'm picking on you because I can pick on you. Mm -hmm. I'm not picking on you because I'm bigger than you. One thing no one who's ever played for the Chicago Bulls can say this, other than one thing when they say Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan winning. That's it. (laughs) There was no other agenda. When Trent came to the Bulls in 92-93 that year, Trent came there with one focus. And every single day that we played and whatever we were playing, right, where we're playing ping pong, we're playing cards in the back, whatever we were doing, there was no doubt of what his focus was. So I get what it may look like from the outside, but when you are committed to a lifestyle where winning is first, second, and third, you you either all in or all out. And that's what the commitment we made. We made a commitment with our life to doing something that we set out to do. And th- that was that was our culture. That was our culture. That wasn't just his culture. It was our culture. And it was our job to bring everyone along for the ride, whether it's, you know, we all, you know, have days off and we all were there. You know, the great thing about our team was, Yes, Michael was going to do what Michael was going to do. But when BJ was off, Trent was a truth teller to me. He was a truth teller to Michael Jordan. He was a truth teller to Bill Cartwright. And that's what made us special. We could tell each other our truth because we built that relationship, which is built on trust. That is what made our group special. And that's, you know, I don't know if it's enough time to see that, but, you know, that's what made us a championship caliber team. Former Chicago Bulls teammates, B.J. Armstrong, you just heard his voice, and our guy, Double T, Trent Tucker, uh, teammates, of course, on an NBA championship team uh, in the early 90s, joining us on the fan. B.J. won, I believe, three rings with uh, Michael. Here's the way one of the writers in Chicago put it, uh, B.J. I'm curious to get if if, if you agree. Uh, Jordan needed all of his ringless partners, Burrell, Bushler, Kerr, Koo Coach, Longley, Wennington, to know that the perks of being a bull could not be enjoyed without a comprehensive understanding of the standards needed to attain such excellence. Those standards had been created long before their arrival. Is that basically what you're saying, BJ? Well, you know, what you did yesterday in this league doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what we did last year, what we did the years before, that was then every year is a new season. You know, I remember when Trent came to the team, you know, we wanted to do something for Trent. What we did the year before really didn't matter. Right. Cause we wanted to create memories with this group. So it's just a new way of thinking and you have to be present in the moment. And that's a unique skill set in, in and of itself. It's only natural to think about what you did last year. It's only natural to get comfortable and say, you know, we are the best team or I'm the best whatever. But what's uncomfortable is you got to do that every single day. And the, the only way you can do that is through hard work. And I think Trent can speak on it as well. Trent, you know, uh, we'll follow it up this way. We had a couple weeks ago a guy, I think you may know, uh, uh, Mark Vansel, who used to cover the Bulls. And it was mm-hmm. a colleague here at the Star Tribune back in the late a- a- 80s. I worked with him. And, you know, Mark. Mark's opinion on all of this stuff regarding the Jordan-challenging teammates is that, one, uh, he did what any really good player tends to do. And, secondly, based on the practices he saw, he thinks it's also being overhyped a little, that people are coming away with the impression that it was like open warfare with Michael Jordan bullying players every, you know, 15 minutes in practice every day, and that he didn't see that, that that, that this angle, while important, is being overplayed a little bit. What, what, what would you say to that point, Trent? Well, I thought 
you know, playing with someone like that, you know, the intensity was there every day because it also was fun because you knew you were in a, a unique situation. And there are expectations and there's pressure, you know, that comes with a championship team. There are demands that are put up on you every day to see if you can live up, you know, to those expectations. And I've always said, Dan, you know, if you're not able to handle the pressure that comes with being on a championship team and the expectations are there, it's the wrong place for you to be. Everyone can't play on the championship team. Everyone would love to play on the championship team. But there are a number of sacrifices that you have to make to be able to fit in, to be a piece of that puzzle. And playing and, and competing against DJ and Scottie Pippen and Michael Jordan every single day, it was fun. Because as a second unit player, you know, there was days we really wanted to go out and wear them out. We really wanted to beat them. And I can tell you a small story. One day we beat them so bad the field stopped practice. And we was talking trash in the locker room, and we was telling Phil, hey, you can't play these guys. They can't beat the New York Knicks. And they took it personally. They came back the next day, Dan, and they beat us by 70 points. <laughs> <laughs> BJ, let me ask you, a because you're in the agent business now, right? And right. I'm curious to know, so, you know, you, you can speak to this. There's a conventional wisdom that, well, Vansel mentioned this, the writer, and I've I've observed it from afar but I'm not in it like the way you are, that it's harder. Players are wired, not to say that it's better or worse, but that it's different, and that players are wired very differently today. And to that extent, it would be it's harder for a guy who wants to do it the way Michael did, and that might be impossible anyway given how good he was, but who wants to be that kind of leader, that it is harder for an individual to play a, even a similar role because players of this generation are not made or not expecting it to the extent that perhaps of your generation's BJ and yours, Double T, were kind of prepared for it and just thought, hey, this is part of the deal. This is part of getting us to where we want to go. What would you say to that, BJ? Well, the, the problems that players face today are, are, are totally different than what you know we faced back then. And, yeah, it's easy to – say what you want to do and, and talk about it and, you know, and, and say those things. That, that's, that's nice. And there's nothing wrong with wanting to do that and having those aspirations. But the one thing when you reach that level and how you reach that level is you got to actually work at it and you got to go through it, right? And, you know, that wasn't an easy road for Michael Jordan to become Michael Jordan. Right. right. Michael Jordan was more than just an offensive player. Yep. He was also the best defensive player. Michael Jordan was more than just the MVP or the defensive player of the year. He had a sense of himself. He had a sense of the authenticity of knowing there was Air Jordan, there was Michael Jordan, there was Mike, there was MJ. He had a sense of like, how to be the leader of the team, but he also knew how to make sure when things weren't going well, he could fit into the team. You know, we always had a, a saying up there, you know, you can play hard, but don't hurt the team. Right? <laughs> he, wasn't, he wasn't reckless with how he shot, even though he could have shot the ball any, every time or any time. He was very efficient. And he was always respectful, right? If, if he knew that Trent and I weren't shooting well yeah. that particular week, he was going to come to us early and tell us, I'm coming to you early. Let's get yourself ready. And we knew when he wasn't playing well, we had to, like, maybe turn down an open shot to get him going or get him, you know, Trent would be on a two-on-one or three-on-one break. Hey, we're going to make sure we get him an easy basket so he can see the ball go through the net. Technical foul may be coming along. Hey, let's let him see the ball go through the net because we know what we all had to do to help one another. So he was very aware of little things like this. And I get what people say. But again, when you see someone that has this awareness, you don't take that for granted. Do you remember, uh, BJ, Double T has talked to us from time to time about a meeting that he remembers with Phil before game six against the Suns. That was, of course, the year where you didn't wrap it up at home. I can still remember Charles Barkley talking about, you know, you guys, you guys can take all the boards off the windows, man. Not going to be any celebrating tonight. 
<laughs> and so you got to go west. I think Michael talked about, hey, I'm bringing one suit. I ain't, we ain't playing game seven. I got one suit. We're finishing this thing in six. Double T remembers a conversation with Phil um, with what would be classified perhaps as the complimentary players about what the expectations were going to be from him. Do you remember that, BJ? Well, yeah, I do, because, you know, the focus is always going to be on the great players, right? And the, the formula for success is the great players have to be great, but the role players have to play their role great. That's what can't be misrepresented, misrepresented when you're talking about winning the championships. And we needed Trent Tucker. You know, the one of the things no one talks about, Trent Tucker was 4-4 four for four yep. in that game, <laughs> okay? We needed for Trent to be perfect in order for us to win that game. So, yeah, Michael Jordan is MVP. Yes, Scottie Pippen was here. But Trent Tucker's professionalism and being 4 for 4 was just as big as anyone else. So, yes, we needed that. We had to have all those guys, and that's what made a great team. Yeah, the star players are the star players, but the role players, they have to come out there and maximize their minutes because – the role players have to do something the starters don't have to do. They have to work their minutes. If Tripp played 10 minutes, he had to work those 10 minutes because those 10 minutes is the difference between winning and losing. Double T, late in the episode Sunday, uh, in a very unusual moment of vulnerability for Michael, he's kind of talking about his role as leader, and he's, he, at the end of it, kind of breaks down and says, break, I, that's it, we're, we're done, in a way that we, we haven't seen a lot of that in this uh, particular um, miniseries. Why do, what, why do you think he became emotional at that moment? What did that tell you? What do you think that revealed about him? He's human. You know, and he has, you know, human's feelings. And at certain times, many people don't believe that great, great players, you know, can be sensitive as well. And his leadership style by so many this time may have been questioned. You know, but from Michael Jordan, you know, to me, and I think BJ can attest to this as well, you know, he was a great leader for all of us. You know, he, he set the tone. And he was willing to do the things that he needed to do to be a great player, and that's why he was asking us, you know, to do the things that we needed to do to be the best so that we could help the team win. You know, Michael Jordan didn't cut any corners, and the one thing that we knew, when that game was on the line, Michael Jordan was going to stand tall and be the best player on the floor. But like like B.J. mentioned, you know, paying attention to the little details, you know, I can remember one night when I came into the game in the fourth quarter against the Cleveland Cavaliers, and I hadn't had a shot, and Phil wasn't going to run any plays for me. The first thing Michael said to me when I got out in the play, he said, run this play, come off me, I set a screen to get you an open shot. And all of a sudden, I comes off the sort of screen, he gives me an open shot. He allows me to get my stuff into the game. And like BJ talked about, you know, that's the awareness, you know, that he had. He made sure that all the players – were in a position where they could where they could be at their best and, and to help the team win. But when you see him in those moments, you know, he's human and he's sensitive, you know, but to me, you know, he was one of the best players for sure I played with, but also he was a great leader as well. Let me ask you guys a toss up question. Either one of you can take this one, um, that I was thinking about earlier today. How do you think could could Michael Jordan have played beside another alpha scorer you know another guy who's considered either center or wing really dynamic scorer who's used to having the ball a lot could michael have made that adjustment or do you think the the alpha in michael you know pippen was more the perfect compliment a guy who could score but didn't necessarily demand the ball do you think michael could have made that work with let's let's say he had Shaq, for example would would michael have made that work or did he have to have he have to be the alpha scorer I believe that if I would say this, uh, if the Michael Jordan comes into the league in 1984 with Shaquille O'Neal being a young dominant inside player, I don't think Michael Jordan would have, would have ever lost. <laughs> <laughs> Eighty-two and all. I mean, because, I mean, because if you have that dominant on the inside, uh-huh. you know, and they are two opposite players, and you know that you got to make a decision. Who are you going to double-team here? 
You want to double team the big fella down low, or you want to double number 23. And, and when the game is on the line, you automatically know that one of these two guys are able to make a play. And if Michael Jordan had the freedom to run around without being double teamed, knowing that he could go to some place to kill him there, I think Michael Jordan would have been in a position to win the championship just about every year. BJ, what do you think? Well, I, I say this. That, I think that question was answered in 92 at the, at the Dream Team. <laughs> he was there with the best of the best of the best. And at the end of the Olympics in 92, all the players deferred to him. He, he, he was exceptionally, he was an exceptional, exceptionally incredible offensive player. But what we all know and came to learn was Michael Jordan was a phenomenal defensive player. He was a phenomenal defensive player. So defensively, yep. he didn't need, he didn't he didn't depend on his offensive ability to affect the game. He could play in any phase of the game that you wanted to play. He was a flawless basketball player. And in ninety two, how was that going to work itself out. Well, Michael Jordan was the best on the offensive end. He was the best on the defensive end. He was the best in transition. He was the best one-on-one -on -one player. He's the best one-on-one -on -one defensive player. So in the end, you know, it is what it is. And uh, certainly he would figure out how to win if you put another, you know, alpha or dominant offensive player alongside him. This is fascinating. I got two last ones to try to squeeze in here uh, with B.J. Armstrong and Trent Tucker, teammates of Michael Jordan, in fact, won the title together, 92-93. B.J. got three rings with Michael. Um, I'm curious to know, you know, the, the Scottie Pippen, they reviewed the one, the, the, the decision to sit out the play, and it's the opportunity for Scottie to say, you know, this many years later, I blew it. You know, I was, I'm human. I, 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 I lost it in that moment for a lot of complicated reasons. I shouldn't have done it. End of story. He chose a different path, which was, yeah, well, no, it's unfortunate, but if I had to do it over again, I would do it again. Um, BJ, w why do you think he answered it that way, and was there any disappointment in, 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 in from you that he couldn't just sort of, I think, completely put it to bed if he had just said, hey, people make mistakes, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm human, and I just, I just got it wrong? Well, you know, I, I can't speak for, for Scotty and how he answered the question, but, you know, the, the fact remains is we all saw what happened. That's, that's no denying what happened. Um, you know, I just want to make sure that when you have a family member and that family member, you know, something happens, then we have to be there for him. And, yes, that was one of the more difficult things I've been through, been through as, a play, a, as a professional player, but it was a, probably one of the most incredible scenarios I've ever been a part of in my professional career because the leadership that was provided by Bill Cartwright, mm -hmm. who Trent knows well, I uh, played with many years there in New York, the leadership and the truth-telling that we all displayed in that locker room, in particular by Phil, was the greatest thing that's ever happened for us in that group that was together because that situation could have gone – completely left. Bill Cartwright sat down and with a heartfelt speech where tears and everything was coming down and he addressed the situation right then and there. And whatever happened then happened, but we cleared the air. Bill Cartwright said what needed to be said. Scotty listened. We said to each other, and, and the fact remains that we had to trust with one another to say this. Mm -hmm. And we go on to take that team, the New York Knicks, and they were a very good team. That yep, year. We took that good. team to seven games, yep. and we were one play away from winning that series. And this, and, and I must remind you, we were minus Michael Jordan. <laughs> we were minus 35 points a night from our team. And no one can deny that arguably that year Scottie Pippen had his best year as a professional. And you had a good one, too, by the way. Didn't you average 15? Yeah. All-star. All yeah. And you know what? But, again, when something happens with our group, we bring those people back in because that's my family. Scotty mm -hmm. is, is my family, and I don't care what happened then. And, yes, we've all had our moments, and, and it is what it is. But we brought him back. We accepted what happened, and we moved on. And then 
better yet, they go on to win three more championships yep. together. So, yes, things happen, but you know what? That's what being on a team is all about. You you grab your teammate and uh, you keep it moving. Yeah, it's a fascinating point because we're talking a lot about Michael's leadership, but that wasn't Michael's leadership that night. He's not there. It's Phil's. Uh, it's no, as no. you say, that Bill Cartwright's, Cartwright. and and several yeah. of the rest of you who are pretty honest about it. And that's a that's a really important point. Last question, yeah. I promise. Um, you know, we, we think of Michael Jordan and his greatness today as just obvious. It's a fact. It's not difficult. It's seeable. Watch the games again. Watch the highlights we're seeing. But if you you guys know this, if you go back to the NBA draft the year he was picked, a lot of people liked him. A lot of people thought he had a chance to be really good. But there weren't that many people saying, watch out, man. This guy's going to change the game. And I'm trying to figure out what, the experts missed. Was it the way North Carolina played? And I know he was really good in the Olympics. In fact, Bobby Knight was the guy who basically said, I've never seen a player like this in my life. But not everybody was declaring right off the bat that you, you, you just wait till this guy takes over the league. So um, why was it not as obvious then as it has become ever since? Either one of you. I think when you, when you play in a college system like in North Carolina, you know, everything was built around team. And most college coaches, you know, they're the guys who stand out front. But I saw Michael Jordan play in high school when I was a counselor at Five Star Basketball Camp, and he was a, and he was a camper. And I came back to Minneapolis, you know, after the after the camp was over, and a number of guys who I used to play pickup ball with, and some of my former Gopher teammates. And the first thing they asked me is, "Who did you see?" I said, there's a kid from North Carolina by the name of Michael Jordan. I said, watch out for him. But I can say this. I had no idea that he was going to become what he became. And I told BJ earlier today, we was having a conversation. I said, the first time I noticed that Michael Jordan was different was in his rookie year. I was guarding him in the exhibition game. I go for the steal. I miss the steal. He goes back door. Truck Robinson comes over to block his shot, and he just muscled the ball into the basket. I knew right then I was looking at somebody different. But, Dan, if I can say this before you end, 1993, game five, Madison Square Garden, the Bulls are down by two points. Everybody in the world knew that Michael Jordan was going to take the last shot or to take the shot to try to tie the game. But this is the unselfishness of Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen. Scottie Pippen steps up, sets a back screen on Doc Rivers. Michael Jordan reads the play. Instead of going one-on-one, he made the pass. And who did you find standing behind the three-point line? My man you talked to today, B.J. Armstrong. On the road, down by two, knocks down a cold-blooded three-point shot to put the Bulls ahead. That's a great way to, that's a great way to leave it. Uh, gentlemen, this has been fascinating. BJ, anything else you want to add before we wrap up? We really appreciate the time. You know what? Can, can you have his back? I just love listening to Trent. This has been great. And, uh, you know, those were great times. And I really appreciate you guys having me on. And, uh, Trent, you're the best. And I miss you. I wish we could get together. And, but, you know what? We got to do the social distancing. But as <laughs> soon as it's over, I'm coming to Minneapolis to see my friends. All right, come on up, man. I, yeah, I'll be here waiting for you. And, and this time has taught me to come into the 21st century. Now I can use Zoom. I can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> Even better. BJ, thanks again, man. Much appreciated. You guys be well. BJ Armstrong helping us out, former Bull. Double T, this was, uh, this was a lot of fun. I bet you it's fun for you, too. It was fun for me. It's always nice to reminisce and, and talk about, you know, old times with the guys who I played with and, you know, the one thing about a team, you know, it's a bond that's going to last for, for a lifetime. You know, you have your ups and downs, you know, but, but you never forget, you know, the struggles that you went through. You never forget the journey that you took, you know, to get, you know, to get to the end game. And the goal in Chicago was to win a championship. And the first day I got there, you know, the one thing that was on my mind the most, you know, could I live up? you know, to the expectations that were expected of me on a daily basis. I had never been in this position before. I played on some very good teams in New York, but now, but this was different. You know, those shots now had to go in. Those shots became bigger because the prize was bigger. 
the end game was big, and it was all about winning championships. And, and luckily for me, I was able to put in enough work to do the right things. I had great teammates who could set me up so that I could make some plays to help them win coming down the stretch. Really appreciate the help. That, and by the way, that, just, that pretty much defines leadership right there, is that expectation, right? That's the whole yeah. point of it. That's what leadership is on the best teams. With yeah, the best players, I've said, and I've always said, you know, you know, good leaders like Phil, you know, they, they, he knew, he knew how to create an atmosphere, and he knew how to push the right buttons at the right time to get us to respond the right way. Thanks again, man. We'll definitely be in touch. Be well. Anytime, you guys. Stay safe. Thanks, well. Double T. That's soon. Trent Tucker, along with former teammate and former Iowa great B.J. Armstrong. That was a lot of fun. Teammates and friends, B.J. Armstrong and Double T. Trent Tucker. We wrap it up with great friends, longtime friends. They grew up together in Sault Ste. Marie. Sweet Lou from the Sioux, Lou Nanny, and his friend, Phil Esposito, as we continue our Legends with Louis series. Well, she sneaks around the world from Korea to Carolina. Picky finger folks up from Berlin down to Belize. Take you for a ride on a slow boat to China. Tell me where in the world is Lou Nanny. Well, we know he's brought to you by NFP Insurance, and because we're in the social distancing phase, he's not in studio. He is indeed on line seven. And he uh, now joins us as well on line number 10. Well, let's put it this way. Louis, uh, we're calling it Legends with Louis series. Here's who we've had consecutively during these weekly visits. Scotty Bowman, Harry Sinden, Glenn Sather, and now today, not for the first time, I might add, on this program, we're pleased to be joined by Phil Esposito as well. Phil, say hi to Louis. Hello, Luigi. How are you doing, my boy? <laughs> Everything's good, Lou. Everything is okay. I played golf today. I played like crap. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least you didn't have to play for any hockey players like you said you did with me, which didn't happen. <laughs> Phil, speaking of golf, <laughs> it's, almost, uh, yeah. it's almost like telepathy. Uh, you mentioned golf today. I got an email from a guy named Robert who says, please ask Phil... If he's ever lost a wedge in the pound at Carrollwood Country Club, then ask the cart guys at the turn if anyone had a swimsuit handy. Does that sound familiar? Well, I, I did lose, uh, yeah, it fell out of my, like, just came right out of my hands <laughs> into the pond, but I didn't ask for a sweatsuit. <laughs> I, I know. I, I, I told him, I said, when you guys are uh, draining or whatever you do to go get golf balls, I said, see if you see the wedge there, it's 60 <laughs> degrees. <laughs> well, you should have got Bob Colford because when he was running the Blackhawks, he was diving for golf balls, and he said he made enough to put his kid through college <laughs> at Medina. <laughs> you are kidding. No, I'm yeah, not. Yeah, Pulley would do that. Pulley would do that. He's so cheap. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> Phil, how are you holding up through the uh, our COVID-19 winter here? Oh, look, uh, it... Uh, I'm holding up okay, and it, it doesn't, uh, you know, I don't know. It just seems to me, I don't go anywhere, of course, because you can't. But now they have opened up a restaurant. In fact, I'm going to lunch tomorrow mm. for the first time in a restaurant. And uh, it, it just is weird, man. This is so weird to me. But look, we got to do what we got to do, right? Um, we got to be kind of safe and yep. all that other stuff. But uh, I, it's funny if if you're not affected by it, and you don't know anybody else that is affected by it, you tend not to think much about it. You know what I mean? Right. To me, I, I don't. And whether that's right or wrong is wild. But my feeling is, uh, I think if we don't get our economy going again, I think it'll be far worse than uh, COVID-19 or coronavirus. I think it'll be much worse. More people will be destitute and everything else. We've got to get the economy back on track. I think there's a lot of concern in that regard and a lot of debate about it. There's uh, a gentleman, you, you, you both, I think, are very, very aware of that. 
Uh, we're going to try to cover a lot of ground today. I don't. I mean, we we last time you were on, you told the uh, the story, and it was very uh, very effective too. The story of of the uh, Blackhawks trading you to the Bruins, much to the uh, chagrin of uh, a little Blackhawks uh, fan uh, who now hosts this program. Because I grew up in the Chicago area, I've never completely gotten over it. And we, I don't know that we need to necessarily go down that road again, but. I am. I'm, I'm going to jump around a little bit because I don't know. You know, you never know when the next opportunity is going to be. And there's so much good stuff that we didn't cover last time. Louie reminded me of something that I either didn't know about or had forgotten. Will you please tell the story? Now, you're already in Boston, obviously, by, by this point. And I think it was 1973. You get hurt against the Rangers, yeah. I think, in the second game of the series. You're the leading scorer in the NHL that year. When weren't you? You hurt your knee. The team gets eliminated. You end up at Massachusetts General Hospital uh, where you undergo surgery with what is considered at that point a career-threatening injury. And then something pretty remarkable happens once your team gets eliminated. Will you tell the audience that story? Well, I I believe we got eliminated on April the 7th. I think it was. I got operated on April 6th. And on April the 8th, or night, uh, I'm trying to remember. I'm I'm laying in bed with uh, a hospital Johnny on, and my leg in a cast from my groin to my tippy toes, and it's up on on traction. You know, it's up in the air sure. with a sling, mm-hmm. and the door opens and in comes Bobby Orr, and he's with Cashman, and they came in and they said, "Wapo, we're coming to get you for the party tonight," and I said, "What?" And my wife, Donna, at the time, uh, my wife at the time, she says, when they left, what are they talking about? And I says, oh, d- don't worry. That, 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 they're, they've been having a few, and they're going to have the wind-up party. And I said, nothing's going to happen. Well, 7 o'clock that night, the door co- opens in my room, and in comes Bobby with a hospital gown on, the mask, the hat. <laughs> It was a guy named Freddie O'Donnell, uh, Kenny Hodge, uh, Cash. There was about five of them. And they said, are you ready? And I said, ready? What are you talking about? (laughs) We're taking you to the party. I said, how the hell are you going to get me out of here? They said, don't worry about it. Bobby had hired a private detective to go to uh, to the nurse's station and ask and showed his badge. And he says, where? Where's the guy that got shot? And the nurse went, what? There's nobody got shot in this floor. It was a Phillips house in Mass General, and she decided she went scurrying around. Now my room was directly across from the elevator, and he bribed the elevator guy. I think he gave him twenty bucks or something, and he wheeled me out. And I'm going, I, this is insane. <laughs> I'm so, and, and they wheel me into the elevator, and we go down to the basement, and they push in the bed, and as they're pushing it. They put the sheet over my head. I think I was dead or something. And as they're going, I hear people say, I think that's Bobby Orr. I think that's Wayne Cashman. And I and I I said to Bobby, I said, What's going on? He said, Don't worry, don't worry, we got you. They get to the door and it's one of those electric doors, you know, with the with the bar in between. Yeah, kind of a divider. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah, okay. And now they can't get the bed through there. So Dallas Smith, Patty Considine, and Kenny Hodge, three of the strongest guys I know, they started to work this uh, this bar, and they pulled it right out of the cement. <laughs> now they could open the door and push me through. They pushed me through, and it now it was cold. And they got me on Cambridge Street, and I'm like, I, I'm in shock. I'm not saying much. <laughs> and I remember going down the street. And people are honking the horns and everything else. And and then, like an idiot, Bobby Bobby says to me, Phil, put your arm out. We've got to turn left here. And like an idiot, I put it out. <laughs> and they get me to the bottom of the Branding Iron, which was Bobby's place. He owned a joint called the Branding Iron. And there were, like, 20 steps up. Now, how the hell are they going to get me up there? Well, they lifted that bed, and they carried it. And as they did it, they broke one of the wheels off. <laughs> so they get me into the middle of the bar, 
they put me in the middle of the bar of bed and everything else. And, they, and I remember Eddie Johnson putting this stinky provolone cheese <laughs> right between my legs. They give me a beer in one hand, a beer in the other hand. They said, let's party. <laughs> About 45 minutes later, I'm watching uh, ESPN, where the uh, television's on. And, uh, you know, they scroll at the bottom. Yes. They, they said, it comes across Phil Esposito kidnapped from Mass General. <laughs> well... I said, Bobby, holy crap, they think I've been kidnapped. He said, oh, I better call Dr. Rowe. He called Dr. Rowe. Dr. Rowe said, well, keep him there. We'll send an ambulance. Bobby said, nope, we took him here. We'll take him back. <laughs> and, he, and I remember Rowe saying later, he said, if you had fallen off, you may not even walk again, let alone ever play hockey again. But they carried me back. Make a long story short, two things. The next day, Bobby calls me. He says, "Wapo, how you doing?" I said, "I'm doing fine, but it cost me thirty-eight hundred dollars for a bed, a door, the electric door, thirty-eight hundred dollars." He said, "Did you pay it?" I said, "Of course, I had to." He said, "What a party!" <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that is too and good. Then they proceeded to lock me in the room, and I remember the nurse telling me. We've had Elizabeth Taylor, John Wayne, John Kennedy, you name it, we've had them. And you're the first person ever to be locked in his room. <laughs> <laughs> that is too good. Phil Esposito is our guest telling us about the night he got kidnapped by uh, his loving teammates. You know, we did talk trade, how you got there last time. But you know what is worth, I think, getting into here is you when that deal is made, you're already obviously established as a really good player. And you're you're not the only person who comes in the deal, but you're also going to a team where there's some established stars as well, and that sometimes doesn't go as well as it did. And because the dynamics, ego, whose team is it, all that kind of good stuff. How did you navigate those dynamics, Phil? When you got there, was it tense at all? Was it difficult to be? Because very quickly, well, you became an alpha, obviously, because of your, your scoring ability. But how did that go? Well, in the beginning, uh, when I was driving, I remember I was driving from Sault Ste. Marie to London, Ontario, where the training camp was, and I'm thinking, boy, I don't know anybody on that team. I, I don't know anybody. And thank God Kenny Hodge and Freddie Stamfield were going to be there. And I do Dennis Hull a little bit. So as we're driving, uh, I mean, as I'm driving, I'm thinking all this. And when I get there, they put me rooming with Teddy Green. Now, Teddy Green, that, that year, him and I had a fight, and he beat the crap out of me. And, uh, and I, I'm thinking, holy, how am I going to handle this? <laughs> As I walked in, Greeny was so nice, such a great guy. But there was another thing. Let's not forget, Derek Sanderson made the team that year, yeah. and Eddie Schack got traded from Toronto. So I go into the dressing room early uh, to, to make sure I got my equipment right and to meet the trainers and all this other stuff. And I'm sitting there going through my equipment, and I hear this. Hi-ho, hi-ho. It's off to work I go. And the door slams open, and there's Eddie Shack with a hockey stick, and it skates over the hockey stick like he's going to an outdoor rink. <laughs> <laughs> he's the guy I, that I everybody said. Everybody uh, started to laugh. Got- Remember I said he got to the third grade when he let the principal use his car. That's right. That's yeah. right, yes. <laughs> and and uh, I don't know, this team just seemed to click. I watched Bobby a lot. Now, during t- training camp, uh, you know, in those days you skated for three days in a row without touching a puck, and you were so sorry you couldn't move. We didn't train in the summertime or anything like that. And, uh, hell, I worked in the steel plant in the summertime. And uh, I remember I remember us guys in, a, in our first scrimmage. It was so intense. I, I can tell you, when people ask me, do you think you can play hockey in a game without friends? I think the players could do that, to tell you the truth. Because, Louis, you know, when we scrimmaged, we scrimmaged hard. Yeah, and training camp was uh, either you're taking my job or I'm taking yours. And, exactly. And, and the funny part was, was what Bill's talking about, uh, Dan, in those days, nobody knew each other on the other teams. You didn't have all these Canadian teams and American teams. Right. 
12 and 15 and 18 where they're playing all over the world. So, you, you know, if you're a good player, you're always playing with the best players in the country. Those days, that never happened. So when you, when you played on one team, you hated all the other teams and you didn't know them. That's right. You just didn't know them. But I got to know these guys pretty quick, and I, I do remember this. After practices, every guy on the team, and even in training camp, and there was a lot of them, we'd go to this bar called the London House. It was 10 or 15 cent drafts. <laughs> we'd throw a buck each in a pot and drink drafts. And we all got to know each other. We got to know each other really well. Hell, we even had fights in there <laughs> amongst each other. Uh, but uh, I don't know what it was. There was something, and it was all bound together by Harry Sinden. And the first practice we had in a scrimmage, Harry comes up to me and he says, I want you to be my goal scorer. I want you to be a shooter. And I went, what do you mean? He says, well, you know, you play with Bobby Hall. And, uh, like, I ended up seventh in the league in scoring that year in the 16 league. So I was, I was 11th, 9th, and 7th in the three years I played in Chicago. So I was moving up. And a lot of people said it was because I played with Bobby Hall. No doubt about it. A lot of it was because I played with Bobby Hall. But, you know, you're a team. It doesn't matter who you play with. You're a team. And uh, it mattered in this sense. Bobby taught me more about life and about hockey than anybody else I've ever been around, especially about life. You know what I mean, Louis? Yeah. Oh, yeah. He was. <laughs> <laughs> you learn a lot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> are we? Uh, by the way, are we uh, ta- we're talking about Hull or we're talking about Orr here? Bobby. Bobby Hull. Bobby Hull. Okay, who you fully played with first. Okay. Chicago, want... Yeah, in, in, in Boston – Bobby and I, we all became friends. Yeah. We really did. Bobby was single. I was married. It was a little different. Sure. I, I hung more with the married guys than I did with the single guys. There's no doubt about that. But we had a group of characters. Howie, I don't know whether you guys saw the 70, um, it was on NHL Network, I think, two nights ago. It was a fabulous. It was about 50 years because it was the 50th anniversary of the Stanley Cup in Boston in 70. And, of course, Bobby's famous goal of right. flying through the air. Yep. And, uh, and uh, boy, I'm telling you, when I watch that, uh, you realize how fast or was. You don't realize it so much when you're playing with them. Mm-hmm. But when I was watching it, Holy Max, I said, this guy was, he could fly. He could fly. And uh, our team just became together. That 67 season, uh, we made the playoffs. We got beat uh, by the Canadians. And, the, and I remember it was at a, a fountain, a water fountain in uh, Dorval. I, Harry was at the fountain having a drink, and I was really thirsty, so I was going to get a drink too. And as Harry stopped, I looked at him and I said, Harry, we're going to win the cup in three years. He says, how does that saying go from your mouth to God's ears? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, the, and, and we did. And the rest is history. We won it. That's all you need to know about the Bumper to Bumper program on Tuesday, May 12th. Tandem Tuesday, BJ Armstrong and Trent Tucker and Lou Nanny and Phil Esposito. Coming up on Bumper to Bumper on Wednesday's program, Pat Kessler among the guests. Stay safe, stay home, and uh, hopefully we all see each other soon. Thanks for listening to Bumper to Bumper with Dan Barrero.